Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another lecture for Physics in Everyday Life and Conceptual Physics. Uh, once again, emanating from my basement, and once again, I can't figure out how to get around to doing this during the daylight hours, so this is uh, Thursday evening on the 26th, but this is the lecture that is scheduled for Friday, March 27. Hope you're all doing well out there in whatever isolation uh, you find yourselves. Obviously, this is not probably ideal for any of us, but uh, hopefully we're making the best of it. If you have questions pertaining to the course or something comes up that's going to make it difficult for you to get some assignment uh, done by the, the deadline, please let me know. We're trying to be as flexible as possible and to help everybody uh, get through these last few weeks of the semester as successfully as we can. So, uh, today's lecture is about photocopiers, and you may not use photocopiers much, I guess, in your own personal everyday life, but when I was thinking about it the other day, there's probably no machine that has been as influential on your educational career, save perhaps for the computer, 
uh, as the photocopier. If you're anything like me, you did tons and tons of worksheets uh, at various points in your educational career. Um, exams were copied on photocopiers. We still do that to this day. I can remember when I was teaching high school 20 years ago, people were talking about, oh, computers are getting everywhere in the schools, so pretty soon we won't have any photocopiers. Well, photocopiers <laughs> seem to still be around, and uh, we seem to still have not figured out how to get rid of traditional paper-based uh, forms of instruction, though obviously this COVID situation is uh, is challenging that a bit. So maybe it takes a pandemic to wean society off of photocopiers. Um, my slides don't want to advance here. So last time we talked a little bit about just uh, some basics of electricity, talked about the atomic structure and how atoms consist of positively charged protons and negatively charged neutrons that are in a small nucleus at the center of an atom. And then electrons are around uh, in what are now known as probability clouds, but for our purposes we can think of them as just being in orbits. That will work fine for everything we want to reason about. Um, materials are classified by how easily electric charge, and specifically by electric charge we mean electrons, move within them. So materials that allow electric charge to easily move are known as uh, electrical conductors, and materials that do not allow charge to easily move are electrical insulators, and that's actually a spectrum. Semiconductors actually sit in the middle, and a material we're going to look at today uh, is not technically a semiconductor usually, but it does actually hit both ends of the spectrum depending on the situation that it's in. Finally, we talked about the fact that electric charges exert forces on each other and that those forces are proportional to how much charge both of the objects have that are interacting, as well as how far apart they are from each other. The more charge, the more force. The more distance, the less force, broadly speaking. And mathematically, that's formulated in something called Coulomb's Law. So toward the end of the previous lecture, we talked about, and I actually did, and maybe some of you out there did as well, um, charging a balloon by rubbing it on your head and then taking it and having it interact with some small bits of paper. And so uh, the balloon, when you rub it on your head, actually picks up excess electrons, not excess electrons, but it takes some electrons away from your head and uh, transfers them to the balloon. So the balloon is now considered to be negatively charged because it has more negative charges than positive charges, even though it has lots and lots of both of those kinds of charge. However, the bits of paper uh, are assumed to be electrically neutral. And by electrically neutral, we don't mean that they have no charge. We just mean that they have equal numbers of positive and negative charge. And so a question that remained here was, how do charged objects actually attract and interact with neutral objects? Shouldn't neutral objects do nothing electrically? What's happening inside those neutral objects? So I'm actually going to encourage you to mess around with a simulator and to, in just a moment here, pause the lecture and so that you can do that. Uh, this is the Balloons and Static Electricity Simulator that is on the FET website. Uh, it is linked from the title on this slide. It is linked from the link on the bottom of this slide. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you could type in the URL that's at the bottom of the slide, or probably the easier thing is to just type in um, FET, P-H-E-T, static electricity, and it'll get you to this place. Um, so in this simulator, you can take this virtual balloon and you can rub it on the virtual sweater, uh, and then you can see what happens when you take that balloon over next to the virtual wall. So uh, when I would encourage you as you're doing the simulator to pay attention to the following things. When the simulator begins, what's the charge on the sweater? What's the charge on the balloon? What's the charge on the wall? Now the way we do this is if there are equal numbers of positive and negative charges, we assume that something is electrically neutral or uncharged. But if there are more negative charges than positive charges, we say that that thing is negatively charged. And if there are more positives than negatives, then that object is positively charged. So when it begins, what's the charge on each of those things? When you actually rub the balloon on the sweater, what happens to the charge of the balloon? What happens to the charge of the sweater? And then what happens when you take the balloon and you bring it close to the wall? And I pay particular attention when you do that to the charges in the wall. 
So again, strongly encouraged at this point, pause the lecture, go play around with the simulator for a few minutes. If you want, there's even two balloons you can charge and see how they interact with one another. And then come back to the lecture and we'll move on with the rest of the discussion. All right, I'd be curious to know how many of you paused and did that, but I guess I don't have a good way of doing that. So honor system, like a lot of things in this uh, distance education era. So a few questions, a couple of questions here up at the top that are on the Poll Everywhere survey. The Poll Everywhere survey, if you're following along in the Google Slides, is linked from the little box that says Poll Everywhere survey down there at the bottom. Uh, or the Poll Everywhere survey link is also posted in the e-learning lecture folder. So when the balloon rubs on the sweater, what happens to the balloon? What did you observe? Electrons transfer from the balloon to the sweater. Electrons transfer from the sweater to the balloon. Protons transfer from the balloon to the sweater. Protons transfer from the sweater to the balloon. Or no charge is transferred, but the charge in the sweater is rearranged in this process. The second survey question involving the simulator is, once you have the balloon charged and you bring it over next to the wall, what happens? Are electrons transferred from the balloon to the wall? Are they transferred from the wall to the balloon? Are protons transferred from the balloon to the wall? Are they transferred from wall to balloon? Or is it the situation that no charge is transferred, but the charge in the wall rearranges? So I'm not going to give you directly the answer to either of those questions. Again, if you didn't play with the simulator, I would encourage you to do so and figure out what happens and what the actual answers are to these questions. But just like we were doing before, you get your participation credit simply for answering at least one of the questions on the survey each time. So we talked a little bit last time about charging and getting excess types of charge on different devices. But today we want to talk a little bit about polarization. And this is all hinging on this question about how does this neutral paper attract this uh, to this balloon. If insulators, and paper would be considered an electrical insulator, you wouldn't make an electric circuit out of paper, you wouldn't use it to replace a wire that was broken for your lamp. Um, so paper is an electrical insulator, and if it doesn't allow free movement of charge, then how, how do these insulators interact with charged objects? Well, when an object is polarized, what happens is electrons are attracted to or repelled from, depending on what the object is that is charged, uh, the approaching charged object, creating an excess of one type of charge on the surface of the polarized object. So in the simulator, you have a charged balloon, and the balloon had excess uh, negative charge on it, so it would be considered to be negatively charged. It approaches the wall. The wall is overall neutral, because if you were to actually count all the positives and negatives in this wall simulation, they would be equal to each other. But the negatives move a little bit further away when the balloon is brought near to the wall. And even if you have an insulating material, you can still get negative charge to move. It might not be able to move across the entirety of the material, but if you think about the structure of an atom with a positive nucleus and then electrons going around, even if the electrons just now spend most of their time on this side of the atom and very little time on this side of the atom, this side of your atom is going to become negatively charged while this side of your atom acts like it is positively charged. So the uh, authors in the simulation showed you kind of a similar thing. The positives stay put, the negatives move a little bit away, and what that has an effect on is making the surface of the wall near the balloon positive and further away is negative. Of course, there's still an equal number of positives and negatives. So how does this result in overall attraction? Well, the secret lies in Coulomb's law, which we talked a little bit about last time. Distance matters specifically between objects. And so if these positive charges are on average closer to this negatively charged balloon, uh, then the negative charges in the wall are to the negatively charged balloon, then the attractive force between the positively charged portion of the wall and the balloon is going to be a stronger force than the repulsive force between the negative charges in the wall and the negative charges in the balloon because the distance between those negative charges is greater. So the attractive force to the positive charges is a stronger force than the repulsive force to the negative charges 
and overall you get an attractive force and if you've rubbed the balloon enough it will actually stick and remain on the wall apparently for quite some time we did this experiment a year or two ago in a different class that i had and we left the balloon on the wall and it was still there the next day uh, when we came back to class so now we're going to talk about uh, these photocopiers and again ubiquitous in our lives and who knows whether in your lifetime photocopiers will still exist at the end of it but arguably a pretty important technology uh, to the development of lots of things and probably to lots of wasted papers and worksheets uh, in, in educational experience as well but they really did transform the way that business was done and it's kind of interesting to learn that when photocopiers were first around it took a number of years to actually sell the idea to a company to make these devices. A lot of companies at the time didn't see the need for it. Hey, we have this whole pool of people who are typists and can type everything we need at the business. Why would you need to make 10 copies of this particular document? So photocopiers, uh, the process was actually invented uh, in the late 1930s by a, an engineer uh, and turns out I think patent lawyer as well um, from the Seattle area named Chester Carlson. And he apparently suffered from some partial paralysis and doing some of uh, his work as a patent clerk with transcribing things and whatever was painful. And I don't know whether that led him to this invention or not, but he was messing around with uh, the concept of producing a photocopier and came up with this process of electrophotography in the late 1930s. And he shopped it around, and I can't remember who all passed it. I think GE passed on it, IBM passed on it. And finally, he found this Halloid Corporation that took his idea. Um, but instead of calling it electrophotography, they rebranded it from their, probably from their marketing folks and called it xerography. Uh, and he, as far as I've read, was not a fan of that name, but obviously that's the name that stuck. And Xerox machines became fairly ubiquitous in the workplace throughout much of last century. Turns out, if you've ever messed around with a copy machine and had to change toner and gotten it all over you and made a mess, which I've done, um, toner is in fact not ink. Uh, it's a mixture of little plastic pieces, rust, pigment, and wax. Uh, and it is those devices, because those things actually... Uh, can be electrically charged. And as we'll see in our subsequent discussion, the electrical charge is really the key for how the photocopying process works. Um, at the time, there was quote-unquote wet printing with mimeograph machines, which I actually remember as a kid being around in a couple of the offices that I still saw. Um, but they were largely and now completely replaced by photocopy machines, which is known as a dry process because it doesn't have any wet ink involved in the printing process. Um, apparently, the fastest copy machine makes over 150, and this might even be an outdated number, uh, copies per minute. Obviously, printing presses themselves are higher speed than that, but the office photocopier can do, uh, I don't know, up to maybe three copies per second. So this is a picture of uh, Chester at work on his process. And in fact, this is a replica of, not a replica, actually an image of the first thing that was ever copied by this photocopying process, this 1022-38 Astoria. Uh, so not really an inspiring message, but there it is, the first thing ever photocopied. Uh, and then this is a, I don't know if this is a replica or an actual device of the first photocopiers that were produced by this Halloid Corporation and then marketed to the wider business community. Obviously, this is a physics class, so we don't, I don't know, I find the history of these devices to be interesting, but our primary purpose is to understand what is the physics principles involved in the photocopying process. So there are actually three questions that we need to respond to uh, in order to make some sense of this. What is voltage? So we're going to give a brief introduction to the idea of voltage. If you're anything like me, that will not be nearly enough to understand voltage. Uh, I actually think it took about three physics courses where we were talking about voltage before I thought I fully understood what it meant, but we'll give it a go to at least build a introductory definition of voltage. What's an electric field? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then finally, what is a photoconductor? And then how do all of those processes come together? Uh, to make a working photocopy machine. 
Well, let's talk first about this concept of voltage. The definition of voltage is electric potential energy per unit of charge. And so let's try to take those pieces one at a time. Electric potential energy. This is the first time we're introducing the concept of electric potential energy, but we have talked previously about gravitational potential energy. And so I'm going to use gravity as an analogy to then think about the electrical phenomena that are happening here. So there's my Earth not to scale. Well, the earth could be to scale, but here's my basketball, definitely not to scale. Um, and so if I have a mass on the surface of the earth, uh, there is gravitational potential energy. It's actually in that system of the mass and the earth. And I can increase that gravitational, excuse me, gravitational potential energy if I increase the separation between those two objects. So if I pull the ball further away from the earth, I increase its gravitational potential energy. If I let that ball go and it falls toward the Earth, it will decrease the gravitational potential energy of the system at the same time the kinetic energy of the system is increasing. Okay, so that would be gravitational potential energy. What would electrical potential energy look like? Well, imagine I have some positively charged sphere. If I have uh, a small negatively charged sphere, it doesn't have to be a sphere, I just drew it that way, negatively charged object, it would naturally be attracted to this positively charged sphere. So there would be energy in this system, but not very much in this configuration. However, just like the mass of the basketball, as I pulled it further away, as I pull this negative charge further away from the positively charged object, I'm actually increasing the energy that's stored in that system because those two things want to be together. So I'm increasing the electric potential energy um, in this system. Now, electricity is a little bit trickier because number one, it's harder to think about and conceptualize, at least for me, because you can't see electrons and protons and see what they're actually doing. You can just have a model of what they must be doing based on a whole bunch of experiments that we've done. So one of the tricks is that uh, everything is going to change if you have positive charges, because a positive charge would naturally be repelled from the positively charged object down there at the bottom. And so when you have a positively charged object, to increase the electric potential energy, you actually have to push them closer together. Broadly speaking, though, you always increase potential energy whenever you take two things and move them opposite to the way they naturally want to go, right? So a basketball is naturally attracted to the Earth. To increase the potential energy, I'd have to pull it away from the Earth. A negative charge is naturally attracted to a positive charge. To increase that potential energy, I'd have to pull it further away. But a positive charge is naturally repelled from another positive charge. So to increase the electric potential energy in that system, I'd have to push it towards the charged object. Now, that per unit charge, why the heck is that per unit charge in here? Why can't we just talk about electric potential energy? Well, it turns out that talking about electric potential energy or gravitational potential energy, you have to know some specific things. You have to know specifically how much mass your basketball has or how much charge your little sphere there is that you are moving relative to this other charged object. And it turns out it's advantageous to not need to know the exact amount of charge or the exact amount of mass if you were doing the gravitational equivalent. You can characterize the properties of a system if you know the energy per charge, and that's more useful because then you can put any amount of charge into that system you want and very quickly figure out how much energy is in that system without actually doing all the calculations each time. All right, concept number two we need for our photocopiers is electric field. I oh, guess that thing was on a build there. Electric field is actually electric force per unit charge. Again, let's start with the gravitational analogy. Earth is thought to be surrounded by a gravitational field. The truth is, it's just a concept that physicists have made up, but it is actually helpful to answering a whole bunch of different kinds of questions uh, about the universe. So let's start with the word field. What do we mean when we say field? Well, if you think about field that you might be familiar with, soccer field, baseball field, football field. Those are all areas where that sport is played when there is no pandemic going on, right? So they're an area where you play baseball, area where you play soccer, area where you play football. Even a 
hay field or a corn field, right, are areas where hay or corn are grown. And so field is really physics speak for an area. Gravitational field is an area where gravity is felt. And so the idea is that everywhere that we are is within Earth's gravitational field. And I don't actually have to have something there for that area to possess the field. So right here, the hypothesis is Earth's gravity has an effect right in this area, even though there's nothing right there. Now, I could test Earth's gravity and see if that's in fact the case. So I could take something and put it in Earth's gravitational field and then let it go. And I could see the effect of that field pulling on it. Um, but the field is thought to exist whether or not there's a mass there. Again, this field concept has the advantage of once I've identified the field and how strong Earth's gravitational field is, I don't actually have to know specific things about the Earth, like how much mass it has and what its radius is. In fact, we've already run into the strength of Earth's gravitational field. It's that old 9.8 number from when we were talking about free fall experiments and things accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. Well, Earth's gravitational field near the surface of the Earth is 9.8 newtons for every kilogram. And that means if I put one kilogram of mass near Earth's surface, it'll feel 9.8 newtons of force. Of course, we round to 10 in this course, at least I do, because it's easier numbers. Put two kilograms in, it gets a force of about 20 newtons. So gravitational field is the area all around the Earth where if you put a mass, it will feel a force from the Earth and Earth's gravitational field points towards the Earth by the convention uh, of the, the direction of the rule. It's the direction that the mass will move if you let it go. Electric field is the same kind of thing, but it's the area around an electrically charged object where another electrically charged object is going to feel a force. So if I have my same positive sphere there, the electric field around that positive field actually, by convention, points outward from that positively charged sphere. And the way you think about this is if I took a little tiny positive charge and put it in this electrical field, which way would it go? Because it would fly away from this larger charged object, the electric field is, the rule is you draw the electric field in the direction that a positive charge will actually move. This also means, by the way, if you put a negative charge into an electric field, it'll move opposite to the direction of the field. Because again, electricity has that, I don't know, difference from gravity, where gravity only seems to have one direction, electricity could be attractive or repulsive depending on the kind of charges that you're dealing with. Okay, so we've talked briefly about voltage, talked briefly about electric field. Third is photoconductors. So photoconductors are materials that actually change their electrical conductivity when they are exposed to light. And so I shot a little video earlier this afternoon uh, that demonstrates this effect. Here's a circuit that I've created uh, using my kids' snap circuit kit. And the actual construction of the circuit is not super important to this discussion. But I just wanted to use this to illustrate uh, the property of a certain kind of materials called photoconductors. So I have a light bulb in this circuit, but you'll notice it's not on. And that's because there is a photodiode wired into this circuit. But if I turn on a nearby light source... Notice that the light bulb over here is now on. If we turn off the light, the light bulb goes off. When the light is on, the light in this snap circuit goes on. And that's actually due to this little photo diode that's, photo diode that's part of the snap circuit. Notice if I cover up the photo diode, light goes off. Uncover the photo diode, the light comes back on. So these photodiodes actually are made of photoconductive material, and when they are receiving light, they are electrically conductive, electrical conductors, but when they are devoid of light or put in the darkness, they actually act as electrical insulators. And it was the discovery of these materials, uh, which wasn't, by the way, the guy that made your first copy machine, but he knew about these materials and then realized how you could use them to actually make the photocopying process. So in your textbook, uh, there is a diagram, and I think it's a pretty good one, 
of the photocopying sort of cycle uh, that everything goes through in there uh, in the photocopier. And we're going to talk about each piece of this process uh, one by one as you go sort of around the loop of the process. But um, you put a piece of paper in the photocopier and it's illuminated by lights. And that image then is reflected off a mirror and shot through a lens and reflected off another mirror. And the number of mirrors and lenses varies depending on the design of the particular photocopier. But it produces an image over here on the photoconducting belt. Now, mirrors and lenses are actually the subject of a future discussion, so we're not going to delve into those uh, in this particular discussion. We're focused on the electrical properties of this photoconducting belt and how that works to produce a replicated image. But there are places in here where there is charge that needs to be transferred. So there's a transfer charger here that charges the paper that comes in from the supply of paper in this photocopier. There is a charger over here called a pre-charger that charges the photoconducting belt before this process works. And the toner particles that are in your toner tank actually have to be electrically charged as well. In fact, the paper for this process to work needs to become negatively charged. And the uh, photoconducting belt that is doing the cycle here has to become negatively charged. The toner needs to become positively charged for all this to work. So all three of those would require this to be hooked to some voltage source, some source of electrical potential energy that would supply negative charge to those uh, transfer charger and the precharger, supply positive charge to the toner tank. Uh, and so that involves plugging into some source of voltage. In doing so, in charging those regions, uh, you're going to build up one kind of charge in those regions, and that's going to produce an electric field. And the electric field is going to be helpful in moving the charge either onto the photoconducting belt or onto the paper, but let's actually go through that piece by piece of the cycle. So there's that same diagram, and what I've done in these slides is just highlight the piece of the cycle that we're talking about. So this all starts uh, when the belt moves past the precharger, and so the precharger is this little negatively charged wire that actually puts off negative charges as well, additional electrons, if you will, uh, and those negative charges, as this belt slides past, are going to slide off onto the charge belt. So you get a layer of negative charge on the top of your photoconducting belt. This is done in the darkness, by the way, because in the darkness, the photoconducting belt is acting like an insulator. So it's like the balloon I rubbed on my head. It can hold the charge on there, and the charge won't move around. At the same time, though, the bottom of this belt is rubbing against a piece of metal that's connected to an electrical ground. Electrical ground can be thought of as just a big reservoir of charge that either accepts extra charge or supplies extra charge as needed uh, for charged objects. So if I get a bunch of negatives that are put onto the top of the belt from this uh, precharger, they're actually going to cause electrical fields which push negative charges off the bottom of this belt. And if you push negatives away from the bottom of the belt, what's left is more positives than negatives. And so after it passes through this precharger, the top of the belt is negatively charged, the bottom of the belt is positively charged. We hang a corner here, and this is where the image is actually put onto the photoconducting belt. So again, you're shining light on this image, but this image is, for our purposes, black and white. And black doesn't reflect light very well. White reflects light quite well. And so the places where there is text here, there is not going to be light reflected onto the photoconducting belt through this light path over here. But the places where there's white space on the paper, uh, there is going to be light that shines onto the photoconducting belt. And recall that photoconductors, when they're illuminated with light, become electrically conductive. So those negative charges, which were essentially stuck in place on the top of the photoconducting belt, are now freed, and they're going to move toward the bottom of the belt because that's where it's positively charged in this belt. Uh, and so what you do is you end up with a belt that has what is known as a charge image. The places that were dark on your paper still have negative charges on this photoconducting belt. 
and the places that were white space on your paper have these places where now the belt is neutral and is not charged. So in this portion of the cycle, you have this charge image, this image made out of electrical charges. You don't have any toner in the game yet. That's coming next. So now the belt moves past toner, and you have these toner wheels or balls or brushes, depending on the particular device that you have, that are carrying charged particles of toner. So the toner, again, is made of plastic bits, uh, and that can pick up an electrical charge, and these are charged positively. So if you are gently putting positively charged toner onto this photoconducting belt, it is going to stick to the places on the photoconducting belt that are negative charges. And so you essentially have now reproduced the image in toner uh, because the toner particles, which are dark, have stuck to all the spots on the photoconducting belt that lined up with all of the dark spots on the paper that you had to start with. Now, of course, you've got to get this onto a new piece of paper. So the way that you do this is, uh, first of all, you send this past this charge erase lamp because you want the toner particles to jump to the paper, not stay on the photoconducting belt. So if you illuminate the whole belt with light, now the whole belt is conductive and all of those extra charges that were negative that were on the belt are going to move down to the bottom of the belt and the belt is going to become everywhere essentially neutral. So now I've got these positive particles that are being held on the belt and they're still in the place of the image. Obviously, they would be easy to move around. So this is kind of a delicate part of the process. They're not held there by electrical forces anymore. But what I do now is I run them past paper that has gone past a transfer charger and picked up its own set of negative charges. So the paper is fed past this transfer charger, which again, hooked to a voltage source, which is building up negative charge on this transfer charger. That negative charge is put off onto the paper. Now I have this negatively charged paper moving past the belt that's holding these positively charged toner particles. The toner particles are no longer stuck to the belt by electrical forces, so they will jump up to the paper and uh, adhere at least temporarily to the paper in the location where those negative charges are. Of course, if you've ever had to service a copier of any kind and pulled out copies before they were done with this whole process, you realize that sometimes the toner doesn't actually stick to the paper, and that's because it hasn't gone through the last step of the process. So the last step of the process, again, is to run this paper past a heater, and this actually, partially at least, melts those toner particles and fuses them to the paper. And again, they're bits of plastic and rubber and pigment and things of that nature. So running it past the heater actually fuses this in the process and leaves the toner stuck to the paper where it does not easily wipe off after this. And so your copy comes out and uh, your belt now moves past another charge erase lamp, again, in case there's any excess charge left on the belt from uh, the paper that it was in contact with, a brush to clean off anything that's excess, and then it goes back through this whole cycle again. Uh, and makes your next copy. So one last pull everywhere survey question just to see if this made any sense to you. If the photocopying cycle were done entirely within the light, so everything was light all the time for this process, what would happen? Would copies be entirely black, that is covered with toner? Uh, you'd still get copies, but the toner wouldn't fuse to the paper. Or would the copies be entirely white and therefore devoid of toner since the belt would never become charged? So um, hopefully you pause this and answer the survey question, but then I'll talk about the answer here in a couple of seconds. Hopefully uh, you guessed C, which is the correct answer here. The copies would not be entirely black and covered with toner because again, everything being in light would basically ruin well, the, the whole thing would always be photoconductive, meaning it would always act like a conductor. So when you sent the belt past the precharger over here, and the precharger was dumping negatives onto the belt, those negatives would just move through the belt since it was a conductor and go to electrical ground and be out of the system. So you'd have a neutral belt everywhere in the system. Well, you take a neutral belt around the corner, 
and you're not going to get the image to show up on that photoconducting belt because everything's already gone. There's no charge to erase areas of. The toner is charged. It's not going to naturally stick to the belt, which is electrically neutral. And so you're probably going to get white copies, nothing copies, uh, if you had light illuminated everywhere. Again, what's really important in this process is that you get light only at very specific times that you want in this photocopying cycle. So that's it for this particular discussion. Of course, you can read Bloomfield's approach on this same idea in Chapter 10, uh, Section 2, and I hope that you'll do so. Today we talked a little bit about voltage, the fact that it's electric potential energy per charge, and we will see that concept of voltage in the very next discussion when we talk a little bit about how some basic circuits work. Electric field is electric force per charge, and electric field is sometimes a useful concept where we can think about how an electric field in an area will push charges uh, one way or another. Photoconductors are a special set of materials that conduct electricity when they are exposed to light, but they don't easily conduct electricity when they are in the dark, so they can actually act as a conductor or an insulator depending on what situation they're in. Finally, photocopiers. Uh, invented in the late 1930s, used voltage to produce these electric fields. These electric fields push charges one way or another, either negatively charged particles onto the photoconducting belt and onto the paper, or positively charged toner particles uh, down onto the charged photoconducting belt. And they used those photoconducting belts, toner particles, and paper to reproduce images and give us all those worksheets that we survived in elementary school and middle school and everywhere else, but now we're at least temporarily a thing of the past here in this era of online instruction. All right, that's it. Hope you're doing well out there. Please contact me if you have questions or concerns, and we'll see you for Monday's discussion.